uh, thank you very much. Now we move to the second presentation. Uh, at the very beginning, I give a, a brief introduction in Farsi and English uh, about uh, Professor Lovell, and then we would ask her to uh, have her presentation. So very welcome. And uh, just a few minutes for introduction, and then we are going to ask you to share your screen. So, Hanone Dovome Embuzemon, Hanume Professor Sara Lovell Hassan, Mudira Makaza Agroforestry, Danishko Missouri, Kedabari, Agroecology, Vataragi, Mazarhoi, Chan Manzure, so Hanone Mikona. Dutur Sara Lovell, Dore Kursio, Sadi, Danishko Missouri, Ambika Hassan, Vamudiat Makaza Agroforestry, Danishko Barotadara, Hamchen in Sovere. تدریس در دانشگاه ایلینوی و ورمانت رو نیز در سابقه خودشون دارن مدرک کارشناسی ارشد و دکترای کشاورزی و همچنین مدرک کارشناسی ارشد معماری منظر خودشون رو از دانشگاه ایلینوی دریافت کردن و به شکل تخصصی در زمینه تجزیه و تحلیل طراحی منظرهای چند منظوره فعالیت میکنن از میان پژوهش پژوهش‌های ارزنده ایشون موضوعاتی مانند برنامه‌ریزی جامع مزارع کشاورزی کشاورزی شهری و اگروفارستری به چشم میخوره ایشون تعلیفات پجویشی میاندانشی ایشان تعلیفات پجویشی میاندانشی خودشون رو هم در موضوعات تاباوری نظام های تولید غذا از طریق روی کرده منظر انجام دادن و همچنین من بعد از ارائه بعد از صحبت بعد از در واقع معرفیشون به زبان انگلیسی از اینجا خواهش میکنم که ارائه خودشون رو Our second speaker, Professor Sara Lovell, is director of the Center for Agroforestry at University of Missouri. Uh, Dr. Lovell serves as H. A. Garrett Endow Chair, Professor and Director of the Center for Agroforestry at University of Missouri. This appointment follows 10 years she served on the faculty at the University of Illinois and the previous three years on, on the faculty at University of Vermont. Her research philosophy has evolved from an interdisciplinary background, including a Master, of, uh, a Master of Science and PhD in Agronomy, followed by a Master of uh, Landscape Architecture from the University of Illinois. Uh, with a focus on the analysis and design of multifunctional landscape, Dr. Lovell's research program has emphasized whole farm planning, productive agroforestry, and urban agriculture. She has published widely in multidisciplinary journals. Dr. Lovell is committed to improving the resiliency of our food system through landscapes that supply nutrient dense and healthy products. Today, uh, Professor Lovell uh, will talk about agroforestry as a guiding framework for designing multifunctional landscapes. Sora, hello again, and the stage is yours. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Okay, excellent. I have my headset on today, so hopefully this will work better. Let me pull up my presentation. Okay, are you seeing that okay? Okay, excellent. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's, it's really an honor to be joining this international group from here in the United States. Um, I guess it's afternoon for you or evening probably and um, early morning here. So um, I'll go ahead and get into my topic for today. It was interesting hearing a little bit from the previous speaker about urban agriculture. I've, I've done some work in that area as well, but today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the broad agricultural landscape, that rural area. And we see like looking at this group that's a lot of, I think, landscape architects and landscape designers and planners, rarely do we engage with these agricultural landscapes. And so many times these agricultural landscapes... There is a small yes. window in the right side of your uh, screen. Please minimize that so that we can see your full screen. Thank you very much. There you go. Okay, yep, great. Thank you for catching that. So uh, these agricultural landscapes, what we find is that they're rarely designed 
it's the same level of intention with the same level of detail and thought that we deal with urban spaces. Most of our landscape architects work on more of these, these urban areas. And we ask this, you know, why is this the case when so much land is agricultural land and in need of thoughtful planning? Well, one thing, of course, is it's, it's very profit driven. So there's that kind of one driver that's very production oriented. Another thing that we see really strongly here in the U U.S. is that there are just lack of consequences for the issues created. So when we see erosion and other issues, many times the landowners just don't, aren't regulated in any way. So that can become a problem. And then the final thing is that in, in most cases, these parcels of land are owned by different individuals. So it's really that one individual who's making the land management decision instead of a larger, broader framework of planning. So what do we do? Because we really want to think on a broader scale, and if we want to address some of the bigger issues related to climate resilience, um, we really need to you know, think about these things from a planning level. And, and we need to engage landscape architects in these landscapes. So I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about a couple of frameworks, agroecology and landscape multifunctionality that can be applied when we think about designing these agroecosystems. I'm going to talk about a design process as well, so the multiple different stages of this design process. And I'm going to use a research farm, uh, the University of Illinois research farm, as kind of a case study to show how this design process works. Then I'm going to talk about some more recent applications, really looking at agroforestry and a productive level of agroforestry that, that might serve as a different kind of solution, a more transformative solution to our agricultural and food system overall. And then I'm going to really think about the human component by looking at our future directions and thinking about human health. So let's first talk about what agroecology is, and this is a field that really developed as a response to the green revolution. So it, it offered an alternative to that very industrial, high input type of agriculture, and really thinking about different options and recognizing that there were these downsides to the industrialized agriculture. We see in agroecology agro that they typically use ecological principles when they're looking at the design and or the management of agricultural systems. Most often we see more emphasis on the management of the system over thinking about uh, a complete redesign of the system. So it's very management oriented, like thinking about managing nutrients. And then we also see when we do look at the design aspects, they typically draw from two different sources of knowledge. One is using the natural ecosystems as a model and trying to mimic those natural ecosystems in how we structure our plant systems, even the agricultural ones. And then also it's kind of going back to the traditional knowledge, the pre-industrial agroecosystems and recognizing that we can learn from some of these very traditional practices. In the US, the, the Native American history on the landscape can tell us a lot about how we might think about our food systems and design them. So the other framework I want to bring up, and this is really one that got a lot of my research, is the idea of landscape multifunctionality. And I use this, this concept as kind of an alternative to talking about sustainable systems, but it, it really is about sustainability of the design of agroecosystems. So with landscape multifunctionality, we're really wanting to integrate not just the production functions, but also bringing in the ecological and cultural functions. And the concept has been applied a lot in European countries. We see a greater, I guess, appreciation for the cultural aspects in particular uh, when we compare it to the US anyway. So it's really thinking about stacking cultural functions ecological functions and production functions. And if we bring all these together, we achieve this higher level of landscape performance overall. The other 
part that I'd like to emphasize is that we really have to think about the site-specific context, which means it's going to be very different if we're thinking about an agricultural landscape that's in a rural area where it's just surrounded by other agricultural landscapes versus something that you're doing in an urban area like you were talking about earlier. And then we also need to think about those needs and the preferences of the users. And so in an urban environment, you have a lot of different users who are engaging with that space. In the rural areas, the main user is really that landowner and just kind of the surrounding landowners in that, that area. So it's not unlike the idea of sustainability. You have kind of the same dimensions. The ecological functions are similar to environmental. Production functions are the economic aspect, and cultural functions are the social aspect. But what I found, particularly when we're talking about designing systems, is that when I talk to, like when I'm teaching a class and I talk to students about designing a sustainable landscape, it's a kind of nebulous term for them. And they're trying to get at you know, the perfect integration of those three dimensions, but it's not very specific. So it's easier to talk about just let's start adding on these different functions. What are the functions that we know we need to attain in the landscape? And the production function piece really still needs to be in there, obviously, with an agricultural landscape. That's what I, um, that's what we basically define agricultural landscapes as. Okay, so let's just talk about some of these functions. With production, we might be producing fresh food or food for processing. But it could include things like medicinal products or firewood, feed that's used for livestock, fiber like cotton. If we're talking about ecological functions, that's more like the biodiversity conservation, nutrient cycling, microclimate control, water quality, the things that we talk about for a lot of spaces. And then the cultural functions are, this is the piece that in the United States we really miss out on in the agricultural landscapes, is the opportunity to integrate things like recreation, thinking about what that visual quality of the landscape is, artistic expression, research, looking at the cultural heritage of a site. So integrating across all of those to think about this higher level of performance. If we think about these two frameworks, we have agroecology and the multifunctionality framework. With agroecology, it's, it's focused on that ecological science. It's connected a lot with, with simple agronomy. It talks about farmer livelihoods and farmer knowledge. Uh, one, one thing that's really different is it is a scale it works at. So oftentimes with agroecology, they're talking about things at just the field scale and maybe up to the farm scale, but really most often the field scale. And they're emphasizing those management practices. On the other hand, with multifunctionality, we're bringing in those ecosystem services or these different functions that I'm talking about. We're thinking broader about rural communities overall in that landscape ecology field. And here we're talking about a scale that really goes from the farm scale up to the landscape or even the region. So some of the applications we see here are about like the planning aspect and different cultural features. If we integrate these two together, I have a lot of pieces on here, but I'm going to emphasize these last couple of what, where we bring these together, what we really gain is this integration of the contemporary scientific knowledge, but also thinking about local knowledge and what's understood in that region and the traditional, more historic knowledge bringing those pieces together to try to come up with the best solution, and then assimilating the, the natural and social sciences together. OK, so the, what I'm talking about with those frameworks, I covered a lot in the, this paper of integrating agroecology and landscape multifunctionality. There's also a part in there that talks about landscape assessment, and there's a landscape um, analysis tool, a multifunctional landscape analysis tool that are some of the elements you see on the upper right-hand side there, where it's looking at these different multiple functions and putting numeric values on those so that you could make a decision between different solutions, alternative solutions. Next thing I'm going to talk about, the landscape design process that is material that comes from this paper, Creating Multifunctional Landscapes. 
I'm going to use the example of the University of Illinois Field Research Station. And this is one of the big agricultural experimental stations that many of the land grant universities in the United States have. Oftentimes a lot of, there's a large area of land dedicated to research uh, to meet the needs of the communities that they serve. And to give you some context here, and, and basically what we are talking about is this first step in the design process, which is designing the project site and looking at the landscape context. This field research station is, is somewhat unique in that it's located so close to the college campus. It's basically a continuum from the college campus to where the research center is located. In most cases, at a lot of universities, like where I'm at now at University of Missouri, the, all of the research farms are located in out, outer areas, more in rural areas. So this one actually abuts the, the urban area of Champaign-Urbana. The darker purple area you can see is where the main campus is located. The lighter pink shows the municipal area. And then that whole area that's green that you see is dedicated to the research center. And then there's that transition zone that I show that used to be where the farm was located, the research center, but that's being overtaken by the campus and particularly like recreational facilities. So you see this tension, I guess, between what's going on in the research center and that it's this high value land and that it connects right up with the university and with the residential areas. So it's important to understand that context and really understand the positive and negative externalities from that. The next step then would be characterizing and analyzing what these existing features are and how these function. So we wanna be able to represent the different biophysical features on the site, whether it's hydrology or land use, overall vegetation, we wanna understand the soil types, even the built infrastructure that exists on the site. So it's a lot of like mapping out these pieces, conducting analysis. Also wanna represent the socioeconomic features and conditions of the site, wanting to think about what the population density is, what the household incomes are. Land values are very important in this area. This is very high value land because it it's, um, competes with other development uses. And then we can actually develop models to predict the types of changes. And on the right, I show, this is just an example of one of the models using a digital elevation model to show the topography of the site, which is, if you saw the site, it's actually very flat. But so the topography is, um, is subtle, but you know, highlighted here to be able to show what's actually going on in relation to the hydrology. So this is a hydrologic model that shows the, the drainage lines and the catchments and then understanding how the flow, overland flow occurs, and then ultimately creating a map to consider monitoring on the site. So the next step when we really begin to understand the site well is to start working on the master plan and understanding how to develop this. And we proposed using this ecosystem approach, which by the name you would guess that it emphasizes ecosystem processes. One part that's really important about the ecosystem approach is that it does recognize humans as part of the system. It doesn't see them as just these se this separate entity that's modifying the landscape. It is our organisms within the system. So we really need to think about how we contribute to the change in the landscape. And it, you can even think about it in terms of our own health, us as humans, how, you know, are we healthy and are we kind of an indicator species of what's going on in that landscape? This approach also looks at integrating these multiple functions. There's an encouragement to increase the heterogeneity of the landscape, so having a lot of different uh, land use types and biodiversity on the landscape, water quality, and managing the quantity of water on a site would be another important aspect. For this particular project, we looked at three different alternatives to kind of push the edges on each one of these dimensions. So on the left, it's a very production-oriented design. It's looking at just the land use as a research farm and as agricultural uses. In the center one, it's more ecologically oriented. 
And on the right-hand side, it's one that's oriented more toward the cultural functions, toward the human experience in that landscape. And then ultimately, coming up with an alternative that tries to bring the best of these pieces together. So thinking about we need to have that agricultural component. We certainly need to have, re it is a research farm, so we need to be looking at research on field crops and on pasture lands. But we can also integrate these ecological features like forests and buffer areas, the prairie that would have been native to this area, integrating that, and then also under, understanding that connection with people. So the next stage is to drill in a little bit, little bit closer into certain parts of the site and develop individual site designs that help to reveal that ecological function. And this, this is something we might refer to as eco-revelatory design, the idea that we're gonna highlight the ecological functions so that users of the site can better understand how that site is working. So if you look in the upper right, you can see that's kind of an index map, and that green box shows the area that I'm highlighting in this larger design piece. So it's one portion of the site that connects with both the university campus and the residential community. So it's a great place to have a research and education center. They have an observatory to kind of look over that whole landscape and then a lot of engagement overall. So in this, in this aspect, in this part of the process, we're looking at using sustainable and local building materials, wanting protect, to protect and treat water on the site, conserving biodiversity, recognizing that agriculture is what the site is all about, and so producing that food and energy, but thinking about how those might be used locally. And in this part of the site, really encouraging the research and public education and really engaging people with the site, even though you, there might be other parts of the entire farm that you might not want to have public access to. So this shows a more detailed plan of what that looks like. On the left, you can see where the tree orchard area is, and that's more research oriented. The smaller cells are showing different demonstration systems looking at different types of agriculture and uh, um, transecting through those areas to see how those are designed and connecting up with the forested area. But again, the, the idea is just, you know, finding those site designs and, and highlighting the functions of those. And then finally, this is a step that's often overlooked and really needs to be considered from the very beginning of the design process is the idea of monitoring the ecological functions over time, even after the design is installed and completed. But it's important to think about this early on because you can create that infrastructure that's necessary to be able to do this. So you're wanting to be able to come up with quantifiable evidence of how the landscape is functioning, understanding that overall performance to see if it's a successful type of approach to see if the things that we're doing are actually more sustainable than what's been done previously. We want to be able to integrate that infrastructure, you know, have these landscape features that, that allow for experimentation, including the replication of different types of systems. And we really want to involve agroecologists and ecologists through this process to understand what are the indicators that we want to look at and what are the variables. And on the right, this comes from that hydrologic model that I showed you earlier. This is an example of thinking about this idea of monitoring early on. And from that hydrologic model, we were able to identify six of these small little sub-watersheds that were similar sizes. They were around um, 30 acres. And the point at which those were draining to a single area, where you might monitor those areas, that are under different types of land use to compare what the water quality is coming off of those. So how does it differ looking at an annual cropping system versus a pasture-based system that has livestock integrated? So this is just an example of by doing this early on, we could put the infrastructure into the site. Okay, so from all of this that I've been talking about at the landscape scale, um, we haven't totally dug into the fact that our agricultural systems 
are generally not sustainable. So overlooked even in agroecology itself is this opportunity for real transformation of the landscape from just a, a strong emphasis on annual cropping systems to thinking about more perennial cropping systems. So Sorry, like Iran. Yes, yep. Uh, could you please uh, turn on your camera because some of the attendees are really interested to see your picture at, at the time that you are presenting. Okay, let me see how I do this. Sorry for um, interruption. Yeah, no problem. I, I had it on at one time, but I'm not sure how I did that quite do. That's great. So you we can see your video right now. Yes. Just go back to full screen mode. Okay. Not in full screen mode. That's fine. Just minimize this small window and it would be fine. Okay, hold on. Okay, how's that? That's great. Thank you very much. Sorry for interruption. Okay. No problem at all. So, like in Iran, much of the produ most productive agricultural land in the Midwest is annual cropping systems. In Iran, it, it's wheat and barley. In the Midwest part of the United States, it's, we have a corn and soybean rotation. But in these systems, we're tilling the land. There are parts of the when the land is often uncovered, and so you have problems with erosion. Um, you're missing opportunities for sequestering carbon in the soil and generally just a system where a lot of inputs are going into the system and you're outputting a, a product that may not always contribute highly to a, a good human health system. So we're proposing that, some, that agroforestry has something to offer here. And agroforestry, basically the definition is integrating trees and shrubs with crops or livestock and it can be and or livestock. There are five main practices that we talk about in temperate zones. One's alley cropping, where we have rows of trees with a companion crop in alleyways. So it would be like planting trees even amongst uh, in a field of, of wheat. So the trees might be planted, um, you know, like 10 to 20 meters apart, and between those rows you could still grow and annual cropping. Forest farming is designed for are naturally forested. This is the idea of growing high value crops that are shade tolerant in the understory of the managed forest. Repairing buffer things that protect stream lakes, improve water quality, pasture brings in the livestock component. So livestock are known to, to be great nutrient cyclers. So they can consume your areas and provide manure that helps with nutrient cycling. And then windbreaks are rows of trees and shrubs that protect, it could be soils or crops or livestock from the wind, and they can also offer irrigation. These are some examples here. You see um, a black walnut combination with spring oats. You can see a coppice hazelnut vegetables grown in the center. And upper right is the riparian forest buffer. And then various other systems. You can see a couple that cattle in a silvo pasture system. Those with, with the cattle, the trees would be mainly designed for timber products. We also see applications for agroforestry in urban areas as well. And so we've added the sixth pra practice the urban food forest, which is bringing in a, a wide range of perennial food producing plants and really looking at how we improve the sustainability and resilience of, of urban communities, but also a really great opportunity for engagement and, and education with urban areas, with urban communities. And oftentimes what we'll see is very diverse mixed structure that you can see here with tall trees and shrubs, so different layers. And the images that you see along the bottom are all came from one single food forest on a, a small, like just a one hectare lot in an urban area. So very diverse. 
again, it, in, at this type of scale, it may not produce a huge amount of food that makes a, a large dent in the food needs for that community, but it certainly offers something for the educational perspective and to buy it. scale, but the same type of mold system is to call production agroforestry. With a lot of the agroforestry practices, they are seen more as supportive um, practices, like the riparian buffers are trees and shrubs that are designed to protect the water, windbreaks might be protecting the crop, but we oftentimes don't see the, the potential or, or have ignored the, the potential for the trees and shrubs themselves to be productive and contribute to the food system. So in this concept, we're really emphasizing the woody specialty crops and particularly thinking about fruits and nuts that can be provided. On the left, you see, I'm showing you some products that are, are native to our region, the pecan, northern pecan is the upper one, a pawpaw, which is the largest fruit native to the U.S. Um, and then some aronia berries, which are, are also native. And so these cover different layers, like the pecan is going to be the large canopy tree. A pawpaw can grow as an understory tree in, in dappled light in the shade environment. And then aronia can be a shrub that grows in between the trees. And so you can see a system that's set up even on a large scale for commercial production. So we asked this question of, can this productive agroforestry concept, could it actually replace some of the agriculture that's in these temperate regions, like the Midwest US? So for our region, what we're thinking about mimicking in terms of the natural system is a savanna ecosystem. Our area had a lot of prairie on it, but there were also a lot of areas that were savanna systems near where there, the water resources were, where you have that multiple level, the canopy trees, and an understory. So the next step would be thinking about what functions our existing system provides, and can we replace those with some of these other alternatives. In this region, I talked about we have corn and soybean here. So the corn is grown for its high starch content. Well, there is actually a nut, chestnut, that is high in starch compared to other nuts. So it could potentially fit into those same markets and same needs. Likewise with soybeans, soybean is, is grown for its high oil content, but a nut like hazelnut has very high oil and could provide some of those same benefits. And as we're looking at this, we need to look beyond just the production aspect, but also thinking about the other ecosystem services, which aren't always given value now, but we're hoping that in the future there's some value for growers to be gained from the carbon that they, that they sequester, from cycling nutrients, from improving water quality, or on the other hand, and having regulations on things that, that impact water quality, so that there would be just more incentive for people to look at different types of systems. And we're thinking about looking at marginal lands, those that aren't as productive for corn and soybeans, as maybe the areas for early transition, for farmers to first try some of these concepts. So we set up a very large scale, long-term study to start to look at this and have treatments that vary in their levels of plant diversity. The control one would be the annual row crop system of the corn-soybean rotation. Then we also have a monoculture orchard, then various alternating tree crops and adding different levels all the way up to a very diverse um, native polyculture system that has a range of different species. I'll show you how this is laid out. So this shows the entire trial, and to give you a sense of scale, I've, I put the plot size in there that it's about half a hectare for each one of those plots. And if you look at the bottom left of that image, you can see one of the buildings there and the vehicles are, are those tiny little uh, items that are located next to the building. So you can get a sense of the scale of the trial. There are seven different treatments. Again, it's increasing the level of diversity. And each one of those treatments is replicated four times. And the numbers on the trial itself show the treatments and where those are located. 
If we zoom in, you can see a little bit better what's going on. There's a treatment one that's the corn soybean rotation. Then treatment two has each one of our main species grown as just a monoculture as it would in an orchard type setting. So chestnut, hazelnut, apple, and currant. And then with treatment, starting with treatment three, we have these alternating rows of chestnut and hazelnut. In treatment four, we add currants in between the chestnuts and hazelnuts. And all the way up to treatment seven, again, which is a very highly diverse treatment that has only species that are native to this region. Looking at that treatment four, which is kind of a mid-level of diversity and pretty practical alternative for a commercial production system, we're thinking about, you know, how does this work over time? What's the succession pattern of, of what's happening here? So the first thing we're interested in is the productivity of the system, what kind of yield it has. And if we're considering corn as being our control, then we can make a comparison there. So over time, uh, you know, some of the tree species that we plant aren't going to be productive in terms of providing nuts in the early years, but we have a forage grown in between the rows that can be harvested for hay. The currants will become productive in early years, but they may taper off then as the area becomes shaded. And ultimately, it's probably going to be dominated by the production of hazelnut and chestnut. This treatment just shows that, that treatment seven alternative, the, the level of diversity in there. It's the same type of pattern where you have the overstory trees, the understory trees, and then shrubs, kind of a hedge of shrubs grown in between the trees but within the rows. And the diverse types of species that we have, again, these all being native to our region but rarely grown. Most of these species are not grown in our region even though they would have grown naturally here. And to kind of think of it conceptually, looking at this, um, this diagram, if you look at the productivity on the left-hand side, basically the yield, compared to the resilience or the ecological complexity. We're looking at, so an annual cropping system would be very high on the productivity end, but very low on the complexity or resilience end. A forest, on the other hand, is extremely complex. But productivity in terms of human, humanly consumable foods that, that yield something, it's going to be low. What we're trying to do with production agroforestry is get off of that transect of these existing options. And it probably will be a system that's not as hot, high in terms of yield as an annual cropping system, certainly not as high in ecological complexity as the forest, but you gain some of the benefits of, of each. So thinking about how we assess the performance of these types of systems, we can look at the yields or the end products and the market values of those. Culturally, socioeconomics are going to be important. A wide range of regulating functions are being studied, looking at nutrient use efficiency, retention of nutrients, water use efficiency and retention, erosion control the carbon that's sequestered by the trees themselves and by the improvement in the soil, the diversity that's conserved on the environment, and looking at the environmental impact overall through a life cycle assessment. But one thing that we've overlooked a little bit is that how, when we're thinking about performance, we're missing something related to how these systems contribute to a healthy human. If we look at only the production in terms of yield or how many calories are produced, then certainly the field corn system is going to rate high on, on that level. But that crop isn't humanly consumable. <laughs> that corn is designed for livestock consumption, not for human consumption at all. Or it goes into high fructose corn syrup or other processed food. In reality, it's not contributing to the human diet very directly, and it's certainly not covering the whole range of expected items that, that we would like to have as healthy humans with fruits, grains, vegetables, protein, dairy. 
So instead, can we think about um, studying these systems, considering what their performance is in actually addressing the human diet and a healthy human diet, and thinking about the resilience of the food system, how those pieces connect. And we're thinking about this even more now that we're responding to a pandemic for the human health aspect and the local food component. Uh, one thing that we found out for sure is that, um, that the human diet is, impacts our health to a great extent. If we look at the comorbidities with COVID-19, a lot of them are related, they're all really related to things that are connected to our diet, like diabetes and heart disease. So, you know, thinking about that human diet, what we can do to mod modify that for a healthier human that can respond better in this type of situation where you're faced with a pandemic. Um, certain foods even can directly address immunity. And we see that some foods have, can help with the disease response and even coping mechanisms, and then locally grown options that offer nutrient-dense alternatives for people in a case where maybe the food system is disrupted. Here in Missouri, one example we look at is elderberry, Sambucus species. It's native to this region, and it has actually shown to reduce a virus directly. Uh, it's a coronavirus that's been tested on, not specific to COVID-19 because we're still, there's still a lot of work to be done there, but a coronavirus similar um, research has been done to show that elderberry, consumption of elderberry can reduce the infected cells and show an overall reduction in the virus. And this shows how that works in that the those bioactive compounds that are found in elderberry actually inhibit the virus. They, um, they basically attack, attach onto the virus so that it can't um, attack the host cell and can't infect the host cell. So again, we don't know that this works exactly with COVID-19, but the fact that there's, a, there's research out there showing a similar coronavirus is very encouraging. Black walnut is another one that we're very interested in. That's a very common tree in Missouri forests already. People actually just go out into existing forests and collect nuts, and those are gathered and, and taken to a facility for, for cracking and then going into the market. Uh, walnuts in particular are known for their heart health, even more than a lot of other nuts. So they produce this, exert this protective effect on coronary heart disease, which again is one of the comorbidities. So reducing the incidence, reducing stroke incidence, and it's something very unique in the, the richness in these the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these health-promoting health compounds exist naturally, but they can also be improved by work with breeders, by selecting and breeding specifically for the components that are, are beneficial for human health. So the other aspect of thinking about our current situation with pandemic is that we've just in our food system. And these can occur at various stages throughout the entire chain of our food system. And some of these were somewhat unpredictable that I don't think people who even were we're thinking in advance about pandemics, considered some of the aspects of how it would impact this, the food system. So one of the first things is that the incomes of individuals are reduced or even lost in some cases. So people have less money to be able to make food purchases. Another um, big thing that we saw was that the, the processing facilities, particularly for meat here in the United States, dealt with with major closures because of the spread of COVID. So there were periods of time during the early parts of the pandemic where the, there was uh, a lack of access to, to meat and the processing facilities were the largest ones actually in the United States were shut down for periods of time. Another item that we deal with is that our farmer population is, is aging. They're an older population, I think, Probably the average age of a farmer in the Midwest U.S. is about 60 years old. 
So, you know, we know that age is one of the factors that's impacted by the disease. So you can imagine that even just getting the crop into the ground can become an issue. There were issues with access to the inputs, like getting seed, getting fertilizer, et cetera. There were trade and import restrictions. So all of these pieces played into showing just um, how our system just isn't very resilient to these types of disruptions. So if we think about agroforestry and the specialty crops that can be grown in these, you know, I gave you the example of elderberry and black walnut, but there are a wide range of species. And, and oftentimes that can be shelf stable and they can be nutrient rich foods. And if, if people even in urban or in rural areas were producing these, they could have these items just available um, in their pantries for these times when we might deal with disruptions. So like with the example of elderberry, we see the potential for freeze drying that the stabilizes those nutrients and allows the item to last for about two to five years. Walnuts are already pretty shelf stable and they can be stored in an airtight container. These extracted oils and juices um, are very shelf stable and can be stocked and stored. So it's a real opportunity for rural communities who are worried about having access to food to be thinking in the future about systems where they're growing food that they can actually eat instead of growing food that must be sent off to processors. So it's basically thinking, can this agroforestry, production agroforestry offer this transformative solution that really starts to heal our food system and allowing this situation we're facing with the pandemic to, uh, to engage people in this question. So a lot of these materials I've covered in various, um, various different publications. I've put some references here for, for further reading and I can share this list with anyone who's interested in. I won't leave it up here now. Um, but with that, I'll just kind of open it up to questions to the group. And I've put also our Center for Agroforestry website here. We're, we're working on a new website, which we're hoping to launch very, very soon. And, but this, the existing one does have a lot of content. If you're interested in the different types of agroforestry and specialty crop systems. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Uh, we are right now ready for questions. Please write down your questions, or if you want to ask the questions orally, please um, raise your hand. I will activate your microphone, and you can ask your question in person. So thank you so much for the presentation. It was great. I have a question you. here. Um, am I right in that uh, the future agriculture is a kind of uh, design and fully planned agriculture. And uh, this is the end of traditional agriculture. Or is this true just in the context of the United States, for example, in other countries, some developing countries, that uh, small they are dominated by traditional lo local or indigenous agriculture? Is it possible for them to develop such kind of agriculture? Yeah, so I didn't hear all of the question, but I, um, I think what you're asked, so what I've talked about today is kind of thinking about the transformation of the system in the very industrialized part of, particularly in the temperate zone, and thinking about alternatives that deal with um, a much more diverse system than these monoculture cropping systems. There are certainly areas around the world where some of the agricultural systems are very, they're very much designed like this, like home gardens in, um, in Central America are, they're basically a form of agroforestry. So in a way, we're like looking to those as for inspiration, I guess, for what we could do to redesign our more industrial types of systems. And 
using the concepts of, you know, dealing with climate change, climate resilience, um, the limitations to our natural resources, food insecurity, using those big kind of complex challenges as the reasons why we should be considering this type of transfer, transformation. I'm wondering, um, I guess I have a question for the, the audience out there, wondering those of you who are landscape architects or who work in landscape planning, are you working in agricultural landscapes? And if so, um, along this line or in some other way, are you engaging in those spaces? I have a background in landscape architecture and environmental design, and I'm currently based in College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, but unfortunately I do have no experience in terms of working with agricultural landscapes and designing and planning them. It's a wonderful field of research, and um, probably this is what we really need as well, just to solve some of the problems in our rural societies or in the farmlands. Uh, I read a few papers uh, written by you, and uh, this is something that I'm really going to build on it and work on it in future. But unfortunately, as far as I know, there is no background in, ter in these areas in Iran. Not yet. Okay. I mean, it's, it's true in the U.S. too that, um, you know, I was in that landscape architecture program after I had a full career in agronomy. and. I was the only person in landscape architecture <laughs> who had any sort of connection with, with agriculture. And so um, you're not alone in not having both aspects, but I think creating in, um, multidisciplinary teams can be very useful. And I feel like the, the skills that landscape architects have for thinking in systems and be, being able to graphically represent the alternatives, uh, um, they can be kind of the leaders in developing the teams that are going to be working on in these applications. And hopefully you would find some, you know, some agronomists or people working in agriculture, or other land uses who think like you do and would be really interested in starting to explore these transformative solutions. And I would like to inform you that recently the Working Group on Agriculture and Landscape has launched mm -hmm. at the International Federation of Landscape Architects. Just started okay. works recently, and um, they have um, kind of uh, defined three lines of working work for connecting agriculture to landscape including uh, urban agriculture, agricultural heritage, and uh, the topic that you just uh, presented, um, multifunctional agriculture. Okay, excellent. The excellent. The other thing is that I'm some seeing some, 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 of, some professors from other universities and faculties. I just want to acknowledge their presence. Uh, Dr. Mohsen Kafi, Dr. Khalil Nijad and Dr. Haydari, especially Dr. Kofi, who is my professor, and I really owe him a lot. Uh, and I hope that in future we can work on this uh, topic as well. Uh, and there is a question uh, about the scale of this intervention from Dr. Khalil Nijad uh, saying, would it be applicable that agroecology principles be applied at site scale? Because most of um, uh, your presentation were about large scale and large scale projects. Uh, I think that he's asking about the smaller scale projects probably in urban areas as well. Yeah, um, absolutely site scale is a great application, especially in, in urban areas. But also it's really the first step even in rural areas. And I focus on what I called whole farm planning, which is like looking at an individual landowner, and they have parcels of land that are located in different regions, but they're the one or in different you know parts of the region. 
but they're the ones that are making the decision on what's going to happen. So looking at that site scale, and even in the rural area, focusing on the, the area of the fields that are connected with the household, like we found that farmers tend to manage those areas that are connected to their own homestead, their own household differently than they manage some of the outlying fields and that they're more open. They, well, they themselves feel some of the externalities, like they feel the um, dr herbicide drift problems or um, water quality problems, are, it's their own water quality. So there are opportunities there. And yes, to the urban setting, urban agriculture is, is one area where I've applied this a lot, where it is, you want to think about the broader landscape context and, and see how the site fits into that. But ultimately, you're designing at the site scale. Very important, yeah. Uh, Mr. or Mrs. Dale Barber, your microphone is activated right now if you want to ask a question. Yeah, Sarah, I've got a question for you. Um, what is the turnaround? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you? Yeah, what, is, what is the turnaround time, say, say taking something from a monoculture uh, through to a, a functioning um, mixed culture? That's a good question. So to be to get to a fully functioning polyculture system, we're probably talking about maybe 10 years for the trees to mature to the point that they're producing, especially the nut trees, take some time to develop. But literally, we can take a field that's in corn and soybeans right now, and we can pretty much decide we're just going to start planting trees into that. And as long as they haven't applied a herbicide or something that has residual that would impact the trees, there's no reason we can't just start planting things. So we would put the trees, seedling trees, into the ground. Um, and then you can also plant in between the tree rows. And that can be any sort of annual or perennial system. It could be the, the hay crop, the pasture crop, or it could just be whatever crop was in there originally. The berries, the shrubs, berry shrubs, those are usually productive within about three or four years, at least here. So you're starting to get some value back even in, in three to four years from some high value berry crops like black currants or elderberry or aronia. So our time, Great, is finished. our time is finished. Uh, I personally do not have uh, much to do, but I know that you're in uh, working hours. Uh, but if, is it okay to ask a couple of more questions? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are two other questions. Uh, one is about um, the question, I read out the question. Do you have, uh, have you done any comparison in terms of annual culture and agroforestry respecting the potential of being infected by diseases? So we do look at disease incidence, and, and I assume you're talking about disease to each one of those crops. We do look at disease incidence in those systems, um, but the weird thing is the diseases for the um, annual crops are very different than the diseases for the tree crops. So each one of those tree crops has a specific disease that it's um, impacted by. And, you know, it, we haven't done a lot in terms of, like, comparing, and this would be the most useful, is comparing a monoculture orchard of, say, apple or something, looking at apple as a monoculture versus apple as a polyculture to see if that same apple, how it's impacted by disease and insects. So there's more work that's been done on insects and understanding um, both Pollinators is one from the diversity, and we do tend to get more diversity of pollinators, but also pest insects that are causing damage to trees. That's a good question, though, and, and more work is definitely needed in that area.
see if there are any more questions. I see one about um, the affordability, the economic aspects, and that's that's a critical piece of the puzzle because if it's not profitable, no one's, none of the growers are going to do it. Um, one of the huge challenges that we face is that we're not on a fair playing field here in the U.S. That um, conventional agriculture, like corn and soybeans, are subsidized by the government. So those farmers for those specific crops are receiving subsidies that make help make them as profitable as they are. So it is hard to compete when we don't have those same subsidies for some of these other crops. Where people are profitable is where they get into the higher value crops and do some of the value added aspects like actually creating the juices or doing the freeze drying so that the items are then available to the consumers at a higher price. But again, it's so hard to compete right now. And also, farmers aren't being taxed in any way for any environmental damage. They're rarely regulated in any way for impacts on water quality or, or anything like that. So if that were to change, or if there were uh, credits for carbon that's sequestered from trees and shrubs, that would add into the economic um, message that, that gets out there. So we're kind of like, we're ahead of where the economics are balancing out, but looking at you know a future in which maybe we at least try to create that fair playing field. Uh, another question is about the issue of ownership. Do you have to face any issues around ownership of the land of, by different people? What we, um, we have to encounter a lot in, in the Middle East and in Iran? Yeah. So here, almost all land is privately owned. Some of it is privately owned. Yeah, so private land ownership is a huge challenge. And sometimes corporations own some of the land, and so that can make things tricky. It's well. definitely, you know, something that we deal with. And the fact that all of these individual landowners, it's hard to get anything that's um, kind of comprehensive across a whole region, if that makes sense. I see a question about tourism, and tourism isn't, agritourism here in the Midwest isn't a big thing just because there's not a lot to see currently. But, but I think if there were more agroforestry, and in the case of urban agriculture, where there is something more diverse and interesting, and if the sites were designed so that they had components that were interesting to view more diverse, then I think there is potential for more agritourism in the area. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we need to wrap up our session. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just wanted to say uh, much for the invitation. Um, great to talk to, to an audience end, this, and I think hear. Thank all of you who participate. That's a nice number of participants. I'm glad you were able to join. <laughs> all right. Okay. Bye. Thank you.